This is a BMW Mini R53 ECU. I took a look at it last year and put a video up on YouTube explaining some of the stuff which uh, I found out about in the internals of the ECU. So this is, I've got about five of these. I've selected this one because the case is slightly rusty. That's the one which I'll take apart to, um, to get to know it a bit more. So I've taken it out of the case already. So this, that's the case and I can put that out of the way now. Uh, and this is the internals of the ECU. Now I've taken a few of the chips off. So these are the chips which I'm going to be taking a look at. Uh, so this is the, the main microcontroller which does all the uh, engine management stuff. Over here there's another microcontroller which I've taken off. I want to take a look at the memory of that because I believe that these pads just above the chip, I think these are to, to do with JTAG or something similar to JTAG so that in the factory they can actually program the memory. Um, so this is the EEPROM memory, with another chip I've taken off over here, which goes with this microcontroller. I think in the factory they use this microcontroller to program the memory over there. Uh, so what I want to do is look in this memory and find out how to program and read the the um, memory from there without taking any chips off the board. Uh, because as you can see, if you take the chips off the board, I don't think it's likely to be very possible to put them back on. Uh, so I want to be able to read and write to these ECUs without having to remove the chips. There's one other chip I've taken off, which is the RAM chip there, because I might do some experiments with that at some point, but that's not as important. So I want to read the contents of this memory, well, the, the memory in this microcontroller, and the contents of this memory, and this is a flash chip itself. Um, not a, This isn't actually intelligent in any way. There's not no microcontroller there. This is a microcontroller which uses that memory. So once again, read those memories. Hopefully I should be able to work out how to uh, actually read and write to this ECU memory without actually removing any chips from the board. So these are three memory chips which I took out of the ECU and I've put them on um, these adapter boards. Now this this one I've put on an adapter board which I bought off eBay because uh, you can get the adapter boards in, in this size uh, chip um, on eBay. And I've had to make the other two adapter boards uh, because I couldn't get the, them for those other chips. Uh, but this one, just the RAM chip, and so I'm not really going to probably do anything with the RAM chip in this video. I'll just put that to the one side. This one is the main one which I'm interested in, which is the microcontroller. So this is a microcontroller. I found information on the data sheet online, and uh, it's based on a very old-fashioned 6502 microprocessor, I believe. Um, so what I want to do is read the program memory off of here, and then look at the program in the memory. So I need to going to need to disassemble the program, uh, and then hopefully work out how to program uh, and read the ECU's memory without having to take these chips off the off of an ECU. And then this is the third chip, and this is the uh, the memory for the main uh, uh, controller on the ECU. And I want to be able to read this. It's not so important that I read this, but I want to read this so that I know exactly what's in. The memory chip of the main microcontroller. So that when I read memory back from uh, from from the actual ECU, hopefully doing it a direct way, uh, I'll be able to compare it with the stuff I read off of this this particular one, and see if what I'm reading back is looks like it's correct or not. So it's on a big adapter board, and unfortunately, because it's quite uh, small uh, lines of um, tracks on this board. Uh, the board didn't, because I'm making these at home, it didn't make very well, so I've got a few uh, patches on there, but hopefully I'll be able to read that memory in anyway. So this is the hardware I've put together in order to read the memory chips. I've got a Raspberry Pi over this far side, so I'm going to write a Python script on the Raspberry Pi in order to read the contents of the memory. But the memory chips I'm reading are 5 volts, and the Raspberry Pi uh, on its I.O. lines can really only uses 3.3 volts. So I've got some uh, integrated circuits in here to to do some adapting of of the of the information going from between the memory and the, the Raspberry Pi. So I've got two um, data buffers uh, and transceivers, so they can receive and transmit data. Uh, and they so I've got two of them. So I've got they're, they're both eight bits each, so I can do up to sixteen bits of of data in a in any particular integrated circuit that I want to read. I'm just using the bottom uh, eight bits on this on this particular integrated circuit, uh, and then I've got a load of shift registers, so that because I can do up to twenty four bits, sorry, thirty two bits of um, addressing lines on on these shift registers, 
So all I need is about four or five uh, lines from the Raspberry Pi to shift data into the shift registers to, to address 32 lines of addressing. So that's another purpose of these integrated circuits is to make it so that I'm using fewer lines on the Raspberry Pi because there's only a lim limited number of IO lines on the Raspberry Pi uh, in order to read the memory. Uh, and then I've got on this top line here, I've got five volt supply and ground so that when I power, power up the chip I want to read, I can power that from five volts. Uh, the output of that go is a five volt output going to these integrated circuits here, uh, but that gets converted by the integrated circuits down to 3.3 volts, so it's safe for the Raspberry Pi. But I've also got some res resistors here because these can be made as input or output, so p potentially you can program, could potentially program a chip in, in, in here because um, I can make, I can write to it rather than read it, but um, as I'm going to be reading it, uh, it goes through 1K resistors just in case the Raspberry Pi is set to output, and this is set to uh, output at the same time, and they, so that they don't sort of pull too much current down the Raspberry Pi IO, IO lines. So I'm going to be reading the program memory from this microcontroller, which came from the car ECU. Uh, and luckily enough, if, when looking in the data sheet for this microcontroller, it's got a mode in which you can actually read the data from the from the program memory. Now this is a mask version of the microcontroller, so there's one time programmable and then there's uh, electronically erasable versions of this. Uh, but the mask version is actually manufactured specifically with a program in it, so I wasn't sure whether I could actually re read the program memory, but I think I can. Uh, and then I've wired up all of, so I've got these jumper leads, so I can configure these however they need to be configured for the specific chip I want to read. So when I put the next chip in to read, they'll I'll reconfigure all these jumper leads, but basically this, all the address lines and the data lines and chip enable lines are set to be pulled low and things like that. Uh, but on the data sheet, it specifies uh, how that needs to be done. Uh, but this also, as it's in microcontroller, it requires a, uh, for well, it requires a, a the crystal to drive the the clock on the on the microcontroller as well so that's why I've got this over here so this is the pay, a page from the uh, data sheet for the microcontroller which I'm going to try and read the memory of and it talks of uh, an EEPROM mode uh, so you can place the device in, into an EEPROM mode by holding the reset um, line low and when you hold the reset line low, rather than these are the pin uh, functions in, in normal mode when the microcontroller is doing its microcontroller stuff. Uh, but out here you see these are the things which happen when you hold the reset line low. And, and the pins become address lines and data lines. Uh, and it becomes like a bit like an EEPROM because you get output enable, program voltage, pin, chip enable. Uh, but you still need a, a, a crystal oscillator, uh, I guess, because it's operating as a microcontroller primar primarily. It's just simulating a, an EEPROM kind of um, device. So the device I'm using is one of these uh, 477M2, so it's mass EEPROM type. And this is the memory map that the data sheet shows. Uh, and the data that I'm going to be reading is the ROM, uh, so it starts at F000. It goes up all the way up to FFFF because we have interrupt vector area as well, which we also need to analyze what's going on. So this is the uh, directory of um, of the script that I've written in 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 um, Python. Um, so I'll go through the actual source code at the end of the video. Uh, these are the two files, the source code files. Uh, I've created a shell script, um, which just gives me like a command line of when I'm running the Python, it takes command line arguments. So if I just run it by itself, it tells me what the uh, command line arguments um, you can provide are. Uh, one is to read the memory device. Uh, these are the ones I haven't implemented yet. Um, this is just, uh, these are just kind of placeholders for future. So I've only really done the read memory device bit uh, and set in the start address, end address, or rather than end address, you can from the start address, you can say how many bytes you want to write, uh, read, uh, and tell it the file where you want to actually place the, uh, the binary dump of, of the data which comes back. So if I go back up to to here, I'll what I'll do is I'll use this command line uh, as an example. So I'm going to read uh, starting at address eight thousand, 
Uh, I'm going to read 8,000 hex um, words, which in this case are bytes because I'm saying the data, number of data bits is 8. And it's going to send the uh, output to a dump uh, file called test dump. Uh, and if I do that without redirecting the outputs, the, the output comes straight to the, the display. And it goes through, uh, and it tells you what address it's reading as it goes through it. And so this goes all the way up to FFFF, at which point um, it will stop and I'll be able to show you the data which has come back. In fact, it will display the data on the display once it's done. And so now it's how it puts in all the all the stuff. It just scrolls over this display very quickly. Uh, but if I scroll up just to the F000 where the data I'm interested in is, so you see at F000 the the data starts being shown, whereas before it was all FF um, X values, it was res responding. So that's very promising. I mean, I haven't done anything with this data yet, but it shows that I'm actually getting the data back from the the um, device and it looks like it's actually reading the ROM values so hopefully I should be able to um, actually disassemble these and make sense of them and try and um, work out what it's doing and another promising sign is at the very top where the um, interrupt vectors are we've got some data there so it looks like I've actually read the, the data from the, from the IC correctly. So this is a brief description of the circuit which I've put together so I've got Four of these seven four five nine five. Now that HC type because HC is a CMOS and they can be powered from three point three volts or five volts. So I need three point three volts for, for the Raspberry Pi side and five volts for the um, the memory device side. Now each one has um, eight outputs, so I'm using them to drive the address lines on the memory device. And now I've got four of these chips. Um, and each one has eight outputs, so that's 32 address lines I can uh, I can drive. Uh, but on the input side, I only need uh, five lines to come in. So I um, you clock uh, the data into the devices serially, and from the output, uh, the last output of um, each device goes to uh, the first input of the next device. Uh, so they cascade down between each other uh, and so from the Raspberry Pi all I have to do is uh, clock in the address that I want to actually um, address on the memory device uh, and that takes 32 clock cycles uh, so it's not fast but um, it, it's okay and from Python scripts, Python scripts aren't particularly fast either uh, but as long as it reads it I only really need to read the device once so it doesn't really matter if it takes a little while to do um, so there I've got the four cascaded down in row and if I scroll across a bit so I put the address outputs onto a connector and the reason why I do that is I use jumpers between the connector and the memory device itself so that um, each memory device will have a different pinout so that I can just put the jumpers in, jumper wires in uh, to actually um, for the actual device which I'm actually using at that particular time and that handles uh, the addressing. So um, each time it reads a memory location, it sets the address first. Uh, and then what it needs is it needs a second part of the circuit. Uh, and these are 74HC245s. These are uh, bus transceivers. So you can send or receive data on this. So at the minute, I'm just receiving the data to the Raspberry Pi. And again, that HC so that on one side, I can have five volts coming from the memory device. And on the other side, I can I have 3.3 volts, so I can communicate directly with the Raspberry Pi. I've got these 1K resistors as well because uh, these can be uh, outputs, and the Raspberry Pi pins can be outputs. If they're both outputs at the same time, they conflict, and it might break something. So have the resistors in just to limit the current, to limit any damage if they're well, to stop any damage if if they're both set to outputs. Um, so on the on the devices also you can set the direction from going from pins A to B or from B to A uh, and for reading the data they'll be set to go from B to A and I've got two of these devices so there's another one down here so I can read devices with up to 16 bits of data uh, for the devices I'm using here now I'm only using 8 bits but for future I thought well maybe I might need to 
to read 16 bits of data so I, I'll put them in two chips in and because the data lines go to the same same place so the data lines here connect there with um, the data lines coming from from here as well so the the bits are the same when they go to the Raspberry Pi but I I distinguish between them because there's these uh, chip enable pins here and here and I only enable the chip that I need to read from at any particular time so I'll enable the uh, one chip to read the high byte and one chip to read the low byte but I'm only ever reading the low byte for this um, I've got a series of just pins for supplying 5 volts and 0 volts so on the, on the memory devices they can have uh, chip enables, they can have write enables and things like that and so I, on those you either need to tie them high or low depending on the configuration that you want to actually use when reading the memory device uh, and then out of the other side um, of these bus drivers so you've got the 16 bits and again that goes to a connector which I can use jumper wires to actually wire up to the device itself so that it can be configured as the pinout of the memory device requires uh, and that's that's the basic circuit so it's not very complicated mainly these integrated circuits here for a couple of purposes to level shift between 5 volts and 3.3 volts for between the memory device and the Raspberry Pi and if the memory device is 3.3 volts then that's fine because it'll, it will level shift 3.3 volts to 3.3 volts anyway um, uh, and the other reason there here is to is to limit the number of line, IO lines on the Raspberry Pi so I'm using uh, the five lines for the address um, data and eight lines for, for the data data uh, and maybe a couple of other lines for things like chip enables and directions uh, and that pretty much fills up what a standard old-fashioned old Raspberry Pi would have on its IO um, there's a few more on the modern Raspberry Pis, a few more IO lines that are, that are available but um, in order to be able to fit the number of lines because the number of dress lines for 32 would take up pretty much all of the um, Raspberry Pi IO lines so that, that's the other reason why these integrated circuits are used to reduce the number of IO lines required. So I'll finish off with the description of um, the source code uh, which I use which is a Python script. And there's two files, there's memory IC, which is uh, this one, which I'm going to look at, which is the class which I use. And the other one is the actual application um, script. Uh, and first of all, I define the GPI pins, which I want to use as inputs on the Raspberry Pi. So pin 9, 22, 27. Uh, and then I define the pins that which I want to use as outputs in an array. And I do, I define them in an array so that when it comes to initialize, I can just go for a loop and initialize what I want to be used as input pins and what I want to be used as output pins. And then just below I define the outputs. So offset zero, which will be pin 14, is going to be this address serial data. Uh, offset one, which is GPI pin 15, will be address not output enable. Uh, and then just go through, I go through the rest of them like that. And the same with the, um, the data ones, but here I've defined it in array. So offset zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it goes offset 9, so it would be GPI 9, 22, 27, 17 in the order there. But I've defined them in an array because um, the data bits all keep together and then I can read them, uh, I can straight through the, the input pins and read the data from the actual IC itself. Um, I define other constants um, like a max address bit, so this is how many times I need to iterate through this, um, sending serial data to the 595 chips so that I can fill up um, the serial data on, on those chips and just output the address lines that I need to output. Uh, clock period is set to zero, but there is actually a little bit of a delay when you when you do a sleep for zero time. And this is just so that um, I don't clock the, the chip too fast. Because uh, I'm using Python on the Raspberry Pi, I might be able to get rid of the those, but um, I'll place it in there just, just in case. Uh, and when I initialize a class, I'm really just setting up the GPIO pins. So I'm setting up GPIO uh, environment to say I don't want any warnings to be displayed. I'm using the BCM type of pin convention 
Um, and then this is where I said I, on the input pins, so I just iterate through all the items in the input pins and I say set up the GPO uh, and then this pin within the input pins has an input. I do the same for the output pins, so I go through the output pins I say set it up, this output pin as an output and just initial values, uh, an output of zero. Um, I call a function turn chips off. Uh, so I'll come to that in a little while, but basically it just sets all the output enables so that the outputs are disabled on all the chip, all the pins. <clears throat> and that's a good state to be in for when you set up the actual, when you do the jumper wires, because if all the chips are turned off, then hopefully there'll be a little, uh, very little power going to the actual chip you're wiring up. Um, so then I, I make it so that I'm only interested in reading from the from the um, memory chip. So for my my buffer, my I think it's two seven four two five four something like that. Uh, I set the direction so that it only reads from the memory chip uh, and into the Raspberry Pi. And then I clear. So my address shift register, I just just make sure it's cleared on initialization. So. I set the serial data to zero. I set the as a default the the serial data clock to, to zero, and then I clock. So these these things occur on the rising edge. So I clock the serial clear pin to zero, and then wait for a period just to make sure that um, that's happened, and then I clock the serial clear to one, and then just wait for a little period. So that that should clear the serial. Um, devices, the uh, LS uh, 595 I think, and then <clears throat> what you, what you, so what these chips have is they have, um, you can clock the serial data into them but they don't actually put the data onto the output pins until you clock this um, this pin uh, which is the, um, the, the latch clock uh, pin and again on the rising edge so you set it to zero first and set it to one and that's so where I've cleared all, all the zeros now, there, now I'm setting those zeros to the output pins. So just making sure that the output's all zero, and that's the initialize. Um, as, so I, at the end of the program, I want to uh, uh, turn off the G, uh, or clear the GPIO as far as Python is concerned. Uh, that I tell it I'm not using it anymore, and so I turn the chips off first of all, set them all to output enabled disabled. Uh, and then I call the Raspberry Pi class or the GPO class to clean up whatever it needs to do. So this is where I turn chips off and it's all to do with these uh, output enable things and because it's a not it's an inverted logic so I set them to one to disable the output. I do that for all of the chips so the, the address chips the data buffer for hide for the high um, data byte and data buffer for low data byte. Uh, and there's only a couple of other functions that I need to do in this class. Uh, one is to set the address. Uh, so I set so, so that the chip is enabled of, on, on the um, serial uh, chips that I've got so that I can actually clock data into them. I then um, Make sure that the data that there's no data currently in the in the serial chips by um, doing this serial clear again from uh, on the rising edge from zero to one. So so now I know that there's no spurious data in there. It shouldn't matter anyway because I'm going to clock through all of the bits of the serial um, chips. So that it'll clock anything that's in there currently out. But it might as well be safe uh, and just do it. It's not it's not time critical. Um, and then I start for bit bit one of the so what I do is when I call this function, I send in the address that I want to um, actually clock into the serial port. I go through the max address bit, which was thirty two, which is set at the top, uh, and I get the bit that I want to actually um, what that I want to actually. Uh, send to the serial port. So I, 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 as I'm interacting through, I, I go from bit zero to bit 31, uh, I think it is. Uh, 
uh, I set the that data on the output pin for the serial data of the serial chips and then I clock that serial data again on the rising edge so from zero to one that clocks it into the actual serial um, chips and they iterate one serial chip once it's it once it's gone through that first serial chip it'll then fall over into the next serial chip and and, it'll, and so the bits as they get shifted through um, cascade through the serial chips uh, and then once I've done all of those addresses address bits out onto the serial chips I then clock that to the output of the uh, of the actual serial chips so so the address is clocked in but whilst it's being clocked in the memory only sees what the last address was and then when we do this clock to the output then suddenly the memory device which we're reading will get the new address uh, placed on it and then there's only one other thing I need to do which is uh, to read the data and I tell it the bit count that I want to read so in the future I might want to read 16-bit devices but at the minute I'm only reading 8-bit devices uh, I make sure that the direction that I'm reading the device is from the memory device to the Raspberry Pi so I set, set the direction on the uh, buffer chips I say if uh, if I'm reading more than 8 bits so 16 bits um, then what I'll do is I'll set the output enable to low to enable the the high byte chip uh, a buffer chip which I'm reading data from and then I go through each of the data pins so I've got a loop here which we should trace through the, the data, data pins uh, and I read those data pins uh, one at a time but append them to my data value so up, up at the top here I set data value to zero and I I append these ones and because it's a high byte I uh, add the length of the data IO pins which would be 8 uh, to the count so this this is set in the high high bits the, the, the bits of the high bytes of, of the data but it's only doing it if I'm if I'm reading more than 8 bits which so this this actual bit of code actually won't get uh, executed for what I'm doing here uh, and then at the end of that, I make sure that the the the, the um, buffer chip that I'm using is disabled. Again, output enable gets set to one, and as it's inverted, that means it's disabled in the chip. Uh, and then for the low byte, it, this always happens. It reads this, so it's, it enables the the low byte data byte buffer. Um, and then it goes through all, uh, it trades for each of the data bits again so this is doing exactly as it did for the high byte it's just appending to the data each of the pins it reads as a data as a data bit and then at the very end it disables the uh, that buff chip to make sure that the the buffer's turned off and i just um just to be sure that i'm only returning the data i need just for the number of bits I want, I mask off the bits I want from the data. So if I'm only asking for eight bits, then it'll mask off the low eight bits. If I'm asking for 16 bits, then it'll mask off the 16 bits. That's just to make sure that I don't get any spurious data coming back. And I return that data item. So that's that's all that's, that occurs in the class. Uh, and then in the actual program itself, there's a it's I should highlight a warning here. So on the Raspberry Pi, when you boot up the Raspberry Pi, the I/O lines could be in any state. You don't know what what state they'll be in. And as the circuitry here, um, it has a buffer direction that you can set. And so if the Raspberry Pi boots up in a random I/O sequence, it's possible that the buffer direction is set to write to the memory chip, and also that the chip enable for the buffers is turned on in which case you'd be putting voltages on the pins of the memory chip so it's best before wiring up the memory chip to boot up the Raspberry Pi run the script once which will make sure that all the chips are disabled then put the chip memory chip you want to actually read in and wire it, wire it up because if you boot up your Raspberry Pi with the memory chip in place it's possible that you might um, damage the memory chip uh, but that's um, unfortunately one of the things about the Raspberry Pi, which is a bit unpredictable. Uh, whereas if you were to write a dedicated microcontroller to do this kind of thing, then you could make sure the microcontroller didn't boot up in that state. So it's a 
is a shame. I could probably put some hardware in in the electronics to prevent this happening as well, but uh, it's, it's that would really. I'm only using this to read some memory every now and again, so it's uh, so I won't bother going into doing that. Then so at the top of this application, I set up uh, my con my they're not constants, they're default values. For like, I'm always uh, by default I start reading memory at address zero and go up to address uh, a 10,000 hex. Um, and the word count by default is zero, dump file name by default is dump.dmp, and data bits by default are eight bits. And it goes through the command line arguments of when you start this uh, Python script uh, and it changes these values which I just described up here to whatever is on the command line. So, it changes. so they, they have default values if they're not specified, but if they are specified, then it overwrites them with what you've put on the command line. Uh, and if you specify the word count rather than end address, then it works out what the max address is based on the minimum address plus the word count. I create an instance of the class which I just went through describing. Uh, if the command line doesn't look like it's got enough arguments, it prints out on the display what, what the command line specification is. Uh, and then it goes through and checks uh, what which switch was used. So for writing the device, it's just I haven't implemented uh, this. I haven't, in fact, implemented anything apart from the reading the chip at the minute. And when you read the chip, it creates a, an array of just default values of FFFF uh, for the maximum address that you're going to use. So it creates like a blank memory map which you can write into. And it get, then it goes straight through the address from the minimum address to the maximum address. Uh, it just displays on the display to keep you updated that it's reading every 100 hex uh, addresses. And it just calls a class to say set the address to what I currently want to read. Uh, and then it calls read data for the number of data bits, which should be 8. And it gets the data back and it just puts the data into the memory map. And so that's 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 all it has to do for reading the, um, the actual memory chip is this uh, iteration here Then after it's read the memory uh, I go through the data which I've read back and I write the binary data to, to the dump file so I've got a binary representation of it which I'll use later to, to assemble the um, code and hopefully work out what it's doing uh, so it goes through the memory map so in the address range which was read uh, and it just it displays a summary on the screen so you can see uh, what's in the memory um, or you can re redirect that to a, an output file as well which is so you can capture that uh, and it just out and as well as that to the file somewhere in here so there's the file close oh yeah there so it writes out to the dump file the, the actual data so it creates the dump file in this loop as well as uh, displaying on the display uh, what the actual contents of the memory are so you can uh, analyze that uh, no, just for debug, I, I had this monitor thing in there, but it's not it's not complete. So this is just junk code really at the minute. But I might uh, expand on that in the future. Or I might use it again to debug. Uh, and then at the end, it just says to close the IOs, and that's all that there is to the code.